In 2012, I took part in an interview for Great Minds, a program produced by the Educational Broadcasting System in South Korea. It was an engaging opportunity to discuss science, rational inquiry, and the evolutionary perspective on life. What follows is a segment of that conversation. I hope you find it thought-provoking. I'm Richard Dawkins, Emeritus Professor of the Public Understanding of Science at the University of Oxford. DNA is often described in textbooks as a blueprint. I think this is very misleading. A blueprint is something that an architect designs for a house or an engineer designs for a car. And the essence of a blueprint is that it's reversible. If you have a house, you can reconstruct the blueprint just by taking measurements of every room and then drawing them out. And you have an exact replica of the original blueprint of the house, similarly with a car. The blueprint is reversible. The DNA that builds an embryo, that builds a body, builds a human, is not reversible. You cannot take a body and make measurements and reconstruct the DNA that built it. DNA is something more like a recipe, a cookery recipe, or a computer program. If you have a cake, you have a recipe for a cake and you make the cake, and it's fine, you follow the recipe and the cake comes out of the oven. You can't take measurements of the cake and reconstruct the recipe. You can't say this bit of the cake corresponds to the first word of the recipe, this bit of the cake corresponds to the second word of the recipe, and so on. The whole recipe has to be followed instruction by instruction in the right order, and a cake will emerge. A computer program is similar. A large, elaborate computer program like Microsoft Excel or Microsoft Word uh, is written by a programmer, by a lot of programmers actually, and then it runs, and it runs very well. But you cannot look at the performance of Microsoft Word or Microsoft Excel and reconstruct the program. You can make a good guess at it, but it's not like a blueprint. It's not reversible like a blueprint. So DNA is not a blueprint of a body. DNA is a program or a recipe for making a body. Bottom-up and top-down design, a very important distinction. An architect designs a house, that's top-down design. The architect conceives it and draws it out, and, and then the masons, the builders, the carpenters, the plumbers all follow the, the design that the architect drew out. That's top-down design. Bottom-up design is a little bit harder to understand because we as humans are not very familiar with it. There's an illustration in Outgrowing God of a termite mound, which looks extremely like a famous church in Barcelona, in Spain, uh, by the architect Gaudi. And um, they look extremely alike, but the architect design is top down. The termite mound, which looks very similar, is very far from top down, it's bottom up. What it means is that each individual termite is following little local rules, little local rules which have nothing to do with the grand design of the whole termite mound. Instead, each termite, each individual worker termite, is following little local rules, like if you see a, 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 little, a, a, a little pile of mud, stick another dollop of mud on the top of it. No individual termite has the faintest idea of what the mound should look like. It may look like a great cathedral, but it's nowhere is it designed. Nowhere is it in, in the DNA or in the nervous system of any one termite. It just emerges from the collective activity of lots and lots of individual worker termites, none of whom knows what they're doing, none of whom has the faintest, foggiest idea of what the final architecture should look like. They just follow little local rules. That is bottom-up design. And it's bottom-up design which actually works in embryology too. The embryo, the, the human body, the body of an animal, is designed 
by bottom-up design, not top-down design. The DNA is not like an architect's plan. It emerges in a bottom-up way from little local rules being obeyed at every little point, every little detail, every cell in the developing embryo. Not far from Oxford is Otmore, where every winter is a spectacular display of starlings, so-called murmuration of starlings. Flocks of starlings, thousands, tens of thousands strong, flying about in beautiful movements. They look like a single amoeba. It looks as though the entire flock is one organism. They wheel and turn, they inter interact with each other, they go through each other in a beautiful way as though they were a single organism, but they're not. They're tens of thousands of individual starlings. And each one is following little local rules. No one starling has any idea of what the final flock should look like. They're each following little local rules like keep your neighbours at a certain angle, certain angles like that. If they all do that, then what emerges is this superb aerial display. There is no choreographer, there is no conductor of this orchestra. It just emerges in a bottom-up fashion. We know this because it's been subjected to brilliant computer simulation. Uh, a computer programmer called Craig Reynolds wrote a program called Boyds, the kind of corruption of the word birds. And what he did was to program in some detail the behavior of an individual Boyd, an individual bird in the, in the computer, in great detail. Never did he program the entire flock. He only programmed the behavior of an individual Boyd. Then he, as it were, cloned them up. He made hundreds of Boyds, all the same, or maybe differing, differing in minor details, and then, so to speak, released them in the computer simultaneously. So the whole coordinated movement comes about not through programming of the flock, not through top-down design of the flock, but through bottom-up design of the individual bird, and then what emerges is the behavior of the flock. Embryology works in a rather similar way to the starling flocks, but it's obviously much more complicated. Uh, what happens is that the behavior of each cell is influenced by the DNA in the, the this is the same DNA in all the cells, and different parts of the DNA, different genes are turned on in different cells. Now, in a rather similar way to the Boyd's program of Craig Reynolds, another very clever uh, mathematician called George Oster wrote a program to simulate parts of embryology. And what he did was to simulate the behavior of one cell and quite a lot was known about the behavior of cells, so he was able to put that into the behavior of one cell, rather like Reynolds into the behavior of one starling. And then he cloned up the cells and made hundreds of them, and then watched how they behaved in interaction with each other. And what happened was that they behaved in the same kind of way as layers of cells do in the development of the embryo. In the development of the embryo, you have, um, first of all, it's a single cell, as you know, and then it divides in two, and then divides into four, and then eight, etc., 16, 32. And then it forms a ball with the same size as the original egg, which is called the blastula. And then the blastula invaginase, a hole appears and it, and it forms a little invagination in the, in the ball. That's called gastrulation. It produces a thing called a gastrula. And then a, by a similar process, neurulation produces the nerve tube. It formed sheets of cells and these sheets of cells then did the same invagination trick of neurulation, exactly like an embryo. It's only a very crude example of something like what goes on in a real embryo, but it illustrates the bottom-up principle of the development of the embryo. The behavior of each cell is programmed by the DNA, and then when the cells get together, they 
behave in such a way as to produce an embryo. In different parts of the body, of course, different tissues are formed. So liver cells are different from kidney cells, different from muscle cells, different from nerve cells, and so on. And that's because different parts of the DNA, different genes, are turned on in different parts of the body. Now, the way in which uh, the DNA works is by programming the development of proteins. And as you know, the genetic code is a, a code whereby triplets of DNA uh, code for one amino acid, and the amino acids then, the, to the chain of DNA in the, in the, in the genome, um, forms chains of, of um, am amino acids, which make proteins. Now, so we have a, a chain of, of amino acids, which is, a, which is a protein. Now, it's part of the chemistry of proteins that they have a tendency to coil up into characteristic shapes. Because of the chemistry of attraction between different amino acids in the chain, they coil up, and the coiling up is into a sort of knot. And the knot is determined by the sequence of amino acids. So it forms a complicated three-dimensional knot, a complicated structure, a three-dimensional structure. Now that three-dimensional structure of the protein determines its catalytic properties. It's an enzyme, a catalyst. And you know that what a catalyst is, is a chemical substance which speeds up other chemical reactions without actually taking part in them itself. So you could think of the cell as being potentially a, a great big vat of chemicals in which any of them could re react with each other, but they don't, unless there's a particular enzyme present. So they're all washing, sloshing around in the cell, and, and, and what determines whether, what a particular reaction happens in a particular cell is what enzymes are present. And that's determined by what DNA, what, what genes are, are turned on. So it's the shape, it's the three-dimensional shape of the protein, which determines its enzymic properties. It's literally the shape. It's, it's like a keyhole. The shape is like a keyhole, which acts as a facilitator of a particular chemical reaction. So if a certain gene is turned on in a cell, that causes particular protein to be formed. The protein coils up into a particular shape, a particular knot, and that determines its catalytic properties. That determines which chemical reactions are speeded up. And that determines the behavior of the cell. The behavior of the cell determines how the cell interacts with all the other cells in a way that I just described with George Oster's simulation. So it's a fairly long chain of causation from DNA to embryology. But every step of the way is now being understood. There is no designer. The form of the body emerges by the bottom-up rules from the chain of causation from DNA to protein to catalyzing the chemistry of the cells to the interaction between the cells. There is no designer. Uh, it, it all just emerges. And the final shape of the body, the color of the body, the behavior of the body, the the limbs of the body, the sense organs, they're all determined by this process. So if the genes that are in the body are good at building bodies that survive, that are good at surviving and reprodu reproducing, then those are the genes that get passed on, and that is natural selection.